I want to begin by talking to you a little bit about what we're calling applied empathy in behavior change. A little bit about me and about where, where I come from. Um, so like I said, my name is Jeff Jordan, President and Executive Creative Director at Rescue Agency. Um, and our organization is focused exclusively on causing positive social change uh, through the use of marketing. Um, we work with about uh, 20 different, um, uh, more than that, we work with about 40 different health organizations around the country like state health departments and federal agencies like the FDA on promoting positive social change within health behaviors on things like tobacco use, um, obesity prevention, alcohol, uh, uh, opioids, marijuana, sexual health, etc. And we're based here in San Diego, so we're so glad that you decided to come and join us. Um, and one of the things that, that, we, that we talk a lot about at Rescue is how important it is to base all of our work in science. And so you're going to be seeing some of that in the presentation today, um, as well as the presentation tomorrow from our, uh, uh, our CEO, Kristen Carroll. So let's begin uh, with a little story about a sloth named Delilah. Now, Delilah had a problem. Let me show you. OK, time's up. Pens down. Delilah, pens down, Delilah. Mm. Stoner sloth. Mm. Poor Delilah. This campaign developed by Sachi and Sachi in Australia uh, was quickly denounced by the advertising and public health community together. It was called an instant and classic fail by Adweek, and those who were the, uh, the subject matter experts that informed the campaign quickly walked away saying they never saw the creative until it launched, and overall it was considered uh, a not so good approach. Now, us in the audience, we can quickly recognize what, and talk about all the little details about what, what was off about this campaign. But there's something in this campaign that is actually present in many campaigns within public health. And that is the use of shame. Shame has been used within public health to try and get people to change their behaviors for decades. Um, let me prove it to you. Okay, everybody, if you know we use you even part of the time. to your mom and dad and brothers and sisters and friends to help take a fight out of crime. Now we've definitely come a long way from McGruff, but the sentiment persists. Today, as you saw in the stoner sloth ads, we continue to use uh, this idea that we can shame somebody into being healthy. Um, and this comes from, um, uh, this has been around for a long time. In the early 20th century, when there were still um, uh, slums and, and, and diseases were, were spreading because of a lack of preventative health measures, health was associated with wealth. And those who were healthy looked down on those who were unhealthy, um, almost synonymously with how they looked down on those who were poor. And this perception of being unhealthy as making you less than, and us who are healthy being holier than thou, has been something that we haven't fully been able to shake. Now, those of us here who are working in public health, we, we probably look at this and say, well, I would never do this and I would never stand for this. But unfortunately, it continues and sometimes it's hidden within our campaigns. Now, what happens when we actually use shame within our, within our strategies is that there tends to be a resistance, a resistance to that shame amongst those who we are trying to embarrass and those who we are trying to insult. They stand up and they find a way to be proud in the behavior because their behavior was not something that they were ashamed of. Their behavior was something that was serving a function for them that played a role in their life. So when we look at what happened when this stoner sloth campaign came out is we saw that resistance at work. The sloth became the mascot of marijuana community. Uh, we started to see art with the sloth in it. We started to see t-shirts with the sloth smoking weed in it. We started to see tattoos. We even had on Amazon a journal to record your cannabis reviews uh, with our famous sloth on it. Because shame doesn't work. Shame just makes people push back. And so how is it that we can move away from this shame? Well, it's with empathy. Empathy and the ability to understand and share uh, the feelings of another 
is what moves us past shame and helps us understand, well, why is it that this person in this group is engaged in this risk behavior? And how is it that we can help them change that behavior? So if we go back to Delilah and we say, okay, let's start with asking, why are some teens using marijuana? Well, teens who use marijuana, there's actually a really huge disparity between those who use it occasionally and those who use it regularly. Teens who are using marijuana regularly often report to us in focus groups that they do it to deal with anxiety, they do it to deal with depression. Some of, us, some of them are telling us about very difficult home lives where there's emotional or even physical abuse, and that marijuana is the only way for them to feel normal when they go to school. Many of them say that they don't have another way to deal with some of these feelings of depression and anxiety, um, and so if they were to stop using marijuana, they don't really know what they would do. And so think about that from the perspective now of the ad that you just saw. Think about, put yourself in the, in the shoes of one of those teens. The ad provided no support. It provided no alternative. It provided no guidelines of how to deal with the problems that you have going on in your life. It just insulted you for choosing this path as a way to deal with what life has served you. Now, teens are actually pretty astute. And not only are they aware that they can just kind of brush this aside, one uh, entrepreneuring teen actually remade the ad and posted it online. Let's take a look at what that teen did. One in five teenagers will experience it before adulthood. Okay, time's up, pens down. Delilah, pens down Delilah. It can leave them sluggish, restless, and unable to concentrate, leading to crippling feelings of guilt, anxiety, and hopelessness. Or worse. Stoner sloth. No, it's depression. And depression doesn't play fair. If you or someone you know is depressed, you don't have to go it alone. Talk to your GP to find out more. A better ad, isn't it? The populations that we're trying to reach know what's going on in their lives. And they disregard messages that ignore their reality and just don't even really pay attention to those campaigns. So not only does shame kind of cause damage on the people that we're trying to reach, it actually limits the reach of our campaigns because people disregard them. So let's go back to empathy and say, well, so how can we be more empathetic in the work that we do? Well, it's not enough to just feel empathy. We actually have to apply that empathy to our work. And so today I want to talk about something new called applied empathy. The idea that it's not just enough to feel for our audience but that we must incorporate that understanding of their struggles and their challenges within our campaign. The realities of what it takes for our audience to change their behavior should be front and center in the campaigns and programs that we make. We should know exactly what path they're going to take, exactly what obstacles they're going to face, and instead of just telling them what to do, our goal should be to guide them and show them how they can do it within their reality. That means that we consider what knowledge they currently have. We consider what their environment is to perform this behavior. We consider the values that they hold, the norms, the cultural norms that exist within their community and their peers, their ability, both physically and mentally, to be able to engage in the behavior that we're asking them to engage in, their own motivations of why they may be engaging in a risk behavior or not, past trauma that may be holding them back from trying something new, and even safety that they may face when trying to engage in this behavior within the community that they're in. It's time for us to move away from telling people this is what you should be doing and move towards telling people, let me show you how this can be possible for you. Now, to do this requires that we accept uh, a difficult truth. And that difficult truth is that every unhealthy behavior has a function. For the most part, people do not engage in unhealthy behaviors simply to hurt themselves. They engage in unhealthy behaviors because they are serving a purpose within their life. And for us to truly motivate them to change, we have to first understand the role of this risk behavior uh, before we have any hope of changing it. So, Think about that, right? We have to, us in public health who are so adamant about how people should be eating, how people should be behaving, how people should, the drugs that they shouldn't do, all these things that we have to stop for a moment 
and say, well, for this person who's doing this, for this person who's eating fast food, for this person that's drinking too much, for this person that's using drugs, what purpose is it serving in their life at that moment? And once we understand that, we now have a wealth of information to be able to stand up and give them uh, advice that actually resonates with what they do. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing that we have to do is we have to set our own attitudes and beliefs aside because they're not always the same as those of our audience. A lot of times we think that everyone is going to perform a healthy behavior for the same reason. But in fact, people perform healthy behaviors for totally different reasons. And your audience may be convinced to engage in a healthy behavior for a reason that's totally different than the reason that you engage in a healthy behavior. And that's totally okay. What it looks like when 100% of the population performs a specific behavior is dozens of different reasons that have motivated small groups of people to change to the point to where everyone now has their own reason to engage in this, in this behavior. And oftentimes, this means that we have to expand beyond our own kind of comfort zone and reach what we call the outer circle. Much of unhealthy behaviors don't live within the center of mainstream culture. The further away a person is from mainstream culture, the more disenfranchised they are, the more they feel like an outcast, the more likely they are to be engaged in dozens of different unhealthy behaviors. And oftentimes, when we perpetuate the idea that the mainstream is healthy, we may be inadvertently reinforcing the idea that the non-mainstream is supposed to be unhealthy, that the non-mainstream is supposed to perform all these behaviors that us within the mainstream are saying are the healthy options. So it requires us to essentially move our aim. And rather than aim at the center of a population, at the average person that exists in our community, to actually aim it to the outskirts of our community. Aim it to those that don't traditionally see themselves within health campaigns and health messages. Because when we start to include them within health, we start to create new pathways and new images of what it looks like to be a healthy person. So one important thing that we have to do is we have to recognize that health shouldn't always look like a stock photo, right? We have to actually move away from the kind of average looking person and think about how is it that we can show different kinds of people engaging in healthy behaviors. So let me give you an example of this. Um, a couple years ago, we got the opportunity uh, to help the state of California uh, promote nutrition. Uh, as part of their, their SNAP uh, ed program. And at the beginning of the campaign, the first thing we did, um, and the first thing that we recommend everybody do as a part of this campaign, is understand the role that unhealthy eating played in the lives of the individuals that we were trying to reach, which in this case happened to be moms uh, who had lower income status. So let's take a look at this quick video of some of those moms telling us how food played a role in their lives. When you have a child, you don't think as you know, the other responsibilities that come along, daycare, food, bills, rent, food, you know, especially when her father's not involved in her life at all. So, um, yesterday I worked 8.30 in the morning to 8.30 at night. When I'm leaving, he's getting up. When I get home, he's going to sleep. I will go get fast food, which is not very healthy, but. <laughs> I try and limit the, limit the fast food. And on the flip side, it is just me at home and there are days where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm tired, I'm done. It's hard, especially if um, you're not healthy yourself, to raise a healthy child is definitely probably the most difficult thing you'll ever do in your life because it's just not gonna happen. I work full time and I go to school and I'm a mom, so I just, I don't have like the two hours to prep up a meal, you know? Just like those commercials that are, you know, showing you how easy it is to eat healthy and everything, but I don't have the time to cut up all the vegetables and to steam all the vegetables and, you know, and then to have to force him to eat it, which, and if he doesn't, it's wasted. Every mom that we talked to wanted to be healthy and wanted to raise healthy kids. There was not a single person in our focus groups that we had to convince to want to be healthy. All of them faced obstacles. And they were asking us not to lecture them, but to help them understand how is it that with everything I just told you, with kids who don't eat healthy foods, with time that I don't have, with, with money that I don't have, how can I raise a healthier family? And so a lot of times, you know, earlier when, when we looked at Stoner Sloth, we looked at what 
pretty obvious example of shame. And I say that shame is pervasive within, within public health because it's often hidden within our campaigns and hidden within our strategies. So let me show you uh, a typical nutrition ad um, that may be similar to the one that woman was referencing when she said she didn't have time. To make wise food choices for you and your family, compare the nutrition information on food labels. Because healthy eating is worth it. Healthy eating. <laughs> it's for life. Learn how the Nutrition Facts Table can help you choose healthier foods. Now, at the service level, this may seem fine. A happy commercial showing a mom and her daughter, uh, you know, checking the nutrition label to make sure they're eating healthy. But let me tell you what it looks like from the perspective of the moms that we heard from in those, in those interviews. They would say that this mom has plenty of time to spend with her child. I don't. That mom can afford healthy foods. I mean, look at the grocery store that she's in. It's beautiful. The grocery stores in my neighborhood don't look anything like that. She obviously has access to healthy food, right? This plentiful produce section. Well, I don't, I'd have to drive 20 miles to get a plentiful produce section. She is lean. She is skinny herself. She probably has never had a weight problem in her life. And obviously her kid is skinny too. Her kid's in soccer. Her kid is physically active. More importantly, her kid is well behaved. She can take her kid to the grocery store and the kid wants to read nutrition labels. <laughs> right? Who is this child? And even deeper, she actually understands what she's seeing on the nutrition labels. With our, which are pretty much a math equation in and of themselves, right? So here we see a spot that we wouldn't call creating shame. But when you put yourselves in the shoes of someone who's struggling with obesity, who's struggling with income, who's struggling with enough time for their children, it does make you feel kind of ashamed of yourself. It reminds you that you're not as good as that mom and that that mom has everything and you don't have any of it. And that's a really, really tough position to be in and it doesn't motivate change, it doesn't inspire change. It actually kills hope because it tells her that in order to achieve those behaviors, in order to be healthy, you have to look like that, you have to live there, you have to have money, and your kid better have been born as an adult. Right? So, so shame is often hidden within public health, but we don't know it until we apply that empathy to our audience and we acknowledge the important truth that no health behavior exists in isolation. It exists for a reason. It is serving a function for that person. Maybe it's because they don't have enough time. Maybe it's because they don't have enough money. Maybe it's because they have a picky eater at home. Whatever it is and that to change that behavior, we have to give that unhealthy behavior its due. We have to say, fine, it is serving a function. It is not all bad. It is helping this person with something. Let me show them how health can help them more. So uh, last year, we launched a campaign with, uh, with uh, the California Department of Health, um, taking on all of these insights to understand, well, all right, we don't have time. We don't, have, we don't want to show perfect looking families. We don't want to show traditional examples because how many of our families are traditional? And we want to try and show a mom who has chosen a healthier path within the obstacles that she faces. Um, and this is one of the, the pieces that came out of that. This is my mom, Sarah. She works and goes to school. And even though she's busy, she always makes time to grab dinner for our family. But today, it looks like she's changing what we usually eat. Are those french fries? Fried chicken, perhaps? Nope. She's bringing home rotisserie chicken and salad. A healthy choice that's low in fat and low in cost, too. But will we like it? Mmm! We love it! Celebrate healthy choices that lead to more successful futures. Visit calfreshhealthyliving.org. So, just like shame can be hidden, um, empathy is in the details as well. Uh, the team worked really hard to understand what was the price point of going to fast food and what was the time it took, right? Going to the, through the drive through took about 10 minutes and it cost about $10, $12 for a family of that size. So we said, okay, what is an alternative that takes 10 minutes 
and that can cost $12 or less. And that was the only acceptable alternative for us to provide. We were not going to provide a you know, completely home-cooked meal that would take a half hour when this mom obviously didn't have a half hour. We were not going to show a meal that would take $20, $30 because obviously they didn't have that much to spend. And this campaign, Healthy Victories, is focused on showing swaps and showing examples that fit perfectly into the constraints that our audience told us that they have. And what we've seen in focus groups now after the campaign, when we talk about these ads, is that even though we're giving them a very specific example, we're hearing from them that they are applying that logic broadly to other examples of what they eat. So we are essentially teaching them how to think about nutrition instead of just telling them to be more healthy. Um, and that's exactly what we want to do. We want to be partners to our audience. We don't just want to be lecturers, right? And so in this case, uh, the applied empathy looks like a busy mom juggling responsibilities, which we heard from our audience. Realistic body types in our casting, right? We got to get away from just showing skinny actors in every single thing that we do, because that's not what our, our typical audience looks like. A daughter and a grandmother, right? That we're both unsure about the healthy options. We heard that from our audience too. It is not just the kids who are picky eaters. It's the other adults in the family that are picky eaters too. And a specific health swap that was at the same price point and time point that it needed to be for it to be acceptable. Now, one swap is not going to change the world, but showing more and more of these ideas of how to live healthier um, and showing how it can be happy, it can be something kids are open to eating, et cetera, will slowly move the audience, uh, which is what we're doing. So applied empathy in health communications looks like this. First, we have to segment. We have to understand who our audience is. That means we've got to get away from saying that our audience is everybody, and we've got to start defining our audience more clearly. Right? And that may take conversations with your audience. It should take conversations with your audience to understand exactly who is it that we want to reach. Um, and psychographics are a part of empathy. Right? Psychographics, different from demographics, they're the things that define people. They're their interests, their values, their hobbies, um, their, how, their profession, all of that, their values. These, these psychographics help us deep, have a deeper understanding of our audience. And then we can segment based on psychographics. For example, we can create a segment of low-income families that are too busy to cook healthy meals. Okay, great. Now we can create a whole campaign about how you can be healthy without any time. The next thing we want to do is we want to create an association. We want to identify audience values that can be aligned with the health behavior. And what we found, particularly in this campaign, was that pretty much everyone we talked to wanted to be healthier, so they already had the value of wanting health for their family. All we had to do was show them a pathway for them. And lastly, we got to empathize. And the only way to empathize is to recognize what it is that our audience is actually going through. That means the realities of their path to change. What are the obstacles they're going to face? And show them a reality that could be possible for them. Show them someone going through those same obstacles, tackling them one by one, and succeeding. They may not have the exact same success, but the more examples you show them of someone going through that same process and those same difficulties they face, the more likely uh, they will venture out and try these things themselves. So we want to look at a cultural value, a healthy behavior, um, and a tailored and targeted message that incorporates our audience's unique pathway to change. So let me show you a few examples from some different behaviors uh, so that we can kind of think about how we can apply empathy across all of our topics. The first example here looks at, um, uh, looks at a specific audience, which we defined as hip-hop youth, um, which was part of our federal campaign uh, with, with the FDA to reach uh, multicultural teens. And what we heard from a lot of these teens was that uh, poverty was, was interchangeable with tobacco use, that unfortunately the, the more poverty there was, the more tobacco use that was visible in their community. And so we wanted to show an example of somebody who could speak to this who could speak to why they chose to live tobacco-free in the face of both poverty and a culture that maybe had more tobacco use than we are accustomed to seeing in our own communities. And this is that example. Um, we create KRIT, it stands for King Remember the Time. I'm known for making that gritty, southern, humble country music. The journey didn't start just going straight to Atlanta. It started from going from Meridian, Mississippi to Birmingham, Alabama, and then to Atlanta. 
And from that point, that's when the journey got really real. Pretty much being homeless, living in hotel rooms, by myself, 18, 19 years old. It showed me that I'm strong enough, and I'm talented enough, and I'm creative enough, and I come from a place where people don't even expect that. What I've noticed nowadays is that a lot of people are using their vices to be creative, and all you're doing is handicapping yourself. The way I feel about tobacco is, is that it's not for me, because knowing that it's the leading cause of preventable death in the U.S. is crazy. We all need to be healthy. We all need to be in our tip-top shape 100% to go out here and do what we do every single day, no matter what. It's that Mississippi native Big Crit, and I keep it fresh and tobacco-free with Fresh Empire. So for those of you who don't know Big Crit, he is a popular uh, rapper. And what he did with his storytelling was he was able to connect together the idea of protecting your health, uh, in this case specifically tobacco use, um, with the idea of, of succeeding and pulling yourself out of poverty. That, that being focused, not being tied down by an addiction was a key for him to be able to get out of the situation that he was in. A story that we don't hear a lot about um, when, we, when we look at low-income communities and, and these teens that, that identify um, uh, um, with, with these influencers. So a really, really important story. This next example uh, focuses on pain and the use of opioids. As we have, as, as the opioid crisis has grown, what we have heard from our audience is that there are many people who use opioids for a specific reason, and they have used it for so long that they don't know how to tackle that pain without it. Um, and they will actually get angry about the fact that public health is trying to reduce opioid use because they feel like they're not being understood uh, by those of us who are seeing the deaths from overdose and trying to change them. And so this particular ad from, a, from our campaign called uh, uh, People's Opioid Project focuses on not shying away from that fear. That recognizing that our audience has that fear and that we have to encourage them to overcome that fear. We cannot make it sound simple. We cannot make it sound like the obvious choice because for them it's not. We have to guide them towards change. And here's what that looks like. I was in a lot of pain. When my doctor prescribed opioids, I didn't question it. And at first, it seemed to be helping. I was following my prescription, but pain was never far behind. That's because opioids mask pain. They don't actually heal it. I was in a tough place. Addiction, overdose, I didn't want that for myself. So I talked to my doctor. But it turns out there are other options. Exercise, acupuncture, massage, non-addictive medications like acetaminophen or ibuprofen. It takes persistence, but I found an alternative that really works for me. If I hadn't talked to my doctor, opioids would have taken over my life. Now I feel stronger and better than ever. And my pain, well, a lot of days it's not there at all. Head to the website to learn about more ways that could work for you. So a lot of key ingredients in this message was the realization that opioids are not actually healing your pain. And that is something, a fact, that a lot of those who are currently using opioids are clinging on to, the belief that opioids is actually helping with the pain rather than that, that it's actually masking it. And a lot of them have given up on the idea that their pain could actually be healed. But there are many, many approaches to healing that pain that, that many of them have not tried. Um, you know, we have to recognize that the opioid crisis grew during a time when the solution to pain was to mask it. And prescriptions, uh, you know, were aplenty uh, for people who felt this pain, rather than the longer and more difficult strategy of trying to actually heal the thing that was causing the pain. And so now, if we truly want to turn the tide on the opioid crisis, we not only have to encourage people not to use opioids, but we actually have to change the perspective of people that pain shouldn't be something that's immediately dealt with, but that pain is something that we work on uh, to eventually reduce and hopefully eliminate through strategies that are not you know, one and done the way opioids are. It's more than just a health education that we need to do. It's a cultural change around pain. And one last example I'll, I'll show you here. Um, another campaign that, that we have um, uh, with, with our good friends at the FDA is uh, focused on the LGBT community. Um, and the LGBT community um, has higher tobacco use rates than, um, than almost any other demographic. 
And one of the things that we really wanted to focus on was, was recognize that for many of them, uh, cigarettes came at a time in their lives when they were trying to accept themselves. And cigarettes came as a release, as a way to escape some of the difficult emotional challenges that, that they were facing. And we said, well, if cigarettes are so tied to the LGBT journey, how can we tie being tobacco free with the LGBT journey? Um, and this is one example from that campaign. Little Lila, when she says she don't want you and you're feeling at your lowest, most broken and lost, you will find a way. Safe from the dark places and the troubles that chase you, you will find a way where you will learn your sexuality is not a curse, where negative thoughts won't cloud your mind, where nothing will hurt your spirit or your body yours to protect and anything toxic you'll reject including cigarettes that can damage nearly every part of your body little lila you have found your voice and you are already on your way home this free life freedom to be tobacco free This Free Life focused on breaking that association between coping and tobacco use, and instead turned it into pride of being tobacco free and of protecting one's body, taking control of the thing, of something that you, that you have control of when maybe so many other things feel out of your control. Now, applying empathy within public health um, requires that we make some changes all the way back to when we do our, our research. A lot of times, public health research is essentially focused on whatever behavior that we're talking about, and we say, well, what do you think about this behavior, and what would convince you to change it, right? And we have focus groups that are designed on just talking about that behavior over and over again, talking about the risks, and have you heard this risk? Have you heard this one? How did that one make you feel? How about this one? Well, we have to change that. We have to change all the way at the beginning when we are putting our programs together and say, the most important thing for me to do is not to talk about this behavior, but to understand everything that surrounds the behavior. What is going on when this occurs? How do you feel when you're not doing this behavior? How do you feel when you are doing it a lot? What else is going on? How does your family act? How, what's, what's your state of mind when this is going on? Um, what originally happened when you first engaged in this behavior? What was your state of mind then? Um, if, you, if the behavior stopped, how would you feel? What would be missing in your life? What would be difficult about making that change? A deeper understanding of what role that risk behavior plays in our audience's life is necessary for us to be able to then put together strategies that apply empathy to our messages so that we aren't just telling people what to do, but we are putting our hand on their shoulder and we're saying, let me guide you to health. Let me show you, let me be a problem solver with you. Let me be someone who is not going to shame you, who is not going to just lecture you, but who is actually going to work on the obstacles with you of what it takes to truly cause lifelong, lasting change. With audience segmentation, with relevant associations, uh, and applied empathy, you can make behavior change programs that guide your audience to healthier lifestyles. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful conference, and I will see you around.